Lecture 8. This is the second of two lectures on the aesthetic imagination. This lecture addresses the emotional side of reception. Now, as I've said, psychological aesthetics deals with the interaction of people with art, literary pieces, films, and other creative works during episodes of creation or reception. We do not address the work in isolation. That's a job of art historians, literary critics, film critics. But for us as psychologists, the artwork is special, the literary work is special, because of the distinctive relationship between the stylistic, physical sensory qualities of the artwork or the sounds of a poem and the narrative information, the semantic information that it provides. Those two domains are related in a whole manner. As I've said before, everyday perception is pragmatic so that these physical sensory qualities are discounted en route to object identification. But in aesthetic reception, we slow that process down, rehabilitating, so to speak, dishabituating, de-automatizing, this disposition to rush past the visual, sound features, etc., so that we can experience and appreciate the style of a work, be it literary or visual or film. Together, these sensory and narrative semantic components form a kind of multi-layered work that yields a multi-layered experience. Now, during these aesthetic episodes, whether we are creating art or whether we are receiving and observing, experiencing art, we shift between two positions, the objectively detached and the subjectively engaged. Now, the objectively detached viewpoint is dedicated to mimesis, semblance. In other words, sometimes we try to focus on how the work is constructed and we try to avoid what's called the affective fallacy, which involves focusing on the emotional effects of the work, what it does to us. So when we're objectively detached, we want to make sure that emotions don't get in the way. On the other hand, when we're subjectively engaged, this is more about spirit resonance. We see the work is open-ended, whether they're images or texts, and we relate to them as individuals or members of a group in a more personal, meaningful, emotional manner. Now, I'm going to address the issue of this depth of affective or emotional processing. And I want to draw your attention to this very interesting distinction. The distinction between dissociation and integration of cognition and emotion in aesthetic episodes. Let me explain. The term dissociation in this context refers to the separation of cognition and emotion. For example, you can walk out of a movie and say, you know, it was a good movie, but I didn't really like it. So I was able to make a cognitive assessment of its structure and separate it from my own personal subjective response. As opposed to dissociation, we have integration, which is an association of thoughts and feelings and emotion. For example, the movie was really deep and reminded me of my childhood. I had a strong emotional response to it. So what it was about and how I reacted to it emotionally worked hand in hand in a kind of integrated, coherent fashion. Again, I return to one of the dominant themes of my book and my lecture series, the relationship between top-down and bottom-up processing. Top-down processing is what the application of objective knowledge and formal codes is really about. We're busy identifying subject matter, naming the style, labeling the style, and we can have success or failure during this appraisal process. In this instance, we can say, feelings are the shadow of cognition. Our attempts to identify the style, our attempt to interpret the subject matter, haven't really worked for us. It leaves a negative residue. Feelings are a reflection of this, a shadow of this. Or alternatively, 
I labeled it quickly, I got what it was about, I feel good about it. Again, feelings of the shadow of cognition, both in a positive direction and in a negative direction. The bottom-up approach is very different. In the bottom-up approach, we engage with the work before us, or that we're reading, and this subjective experience onsets rapidly, reflects the resonance with personal meanings. I'm looking at the work, and it's reaching deep into me. That's why I've said emotions are feelings filled with meaning related to the self, personal or social. And it's attachment to the work that results from these personal connections and the kind of elaborations which unfold or emerge during the aesthetic episode. Top-down, analysis, bottom-up, spontaneous relationship. Why? Because it's reaching in. This gives us a certain challenge to optimize our distance from the work. Just how close in do I get? Just how far back do I get? The deeper we get into the work, our separation from it disappears. Imagine as a religious individual sitting in front of a religious work of art, one passes through that work into the spiritual world. The separation disappears. Or you stand back as an analyst thinking about the criteria, whether it's good or bad. You've pulled back. This is a theme that the British psychologist Edward Bullock in 1912 wrote about in what's considered a classic paper. And it relates to the aesthetic attitude. As he pointed out, we know a thing not to exist, but we accept its existence. We know we're looking at a work of art. We know that someone created it. We know that it's artificial, but yet we accept it as if it were real. As if. And he proposed the principle of concordance to talk about this optimization. The utmost decrease of distance without its disappearance. So when we're doing an aesthetic approach to the world, we want to get into it, but not so into it that, as in the Punch and Judy, when the, when the marionette or the puppet is chasing the other one, the little kids get scared and they say, careful, careful, because they've lost the aesthetic distance. With age, we know that it's not real. We can become absorbed, but we need to optimize our distance from it. We need to find a balance between two extremes. Complete objective detachment, regarding its generic value, we call this over-distancing. We become too detached and disengaged. We imagine the challenge faced by the dance critic or the film critic who sees hundreds and hundreds of movies who stand so far back and they have to write something for the next morning's newspaper that they can't really get absorbed. So they're overly distant. Well, what do they do in their time off? How easily can they shift? And then on the other hand, we have complete subjective absorption. Something about the work has drawn me in. We call it under-distancing. The event appears too real, it's too personal. It's, it's my life. It's not just an aesthetic work. In short, with reference to optimization of aesthetic distance, we need to balance objective understanding of the work that moves us back and the affective potency of the work that draws us in. We need to balance mimesis, assessment of its simulation qualities, with personal resonance, how much it's relevant to my life. Another way to say it, in terms of the series of my lectures, is we're balancing the thinking I that analyzes and the being I, capital I, that relates to something in a personal and in an intimate way. In sum, to have an aesthetic experience, we need to find the right balance between total involvement in total detached reflection. Now, let me shift for a second and talk about two complementary processes that are relevant both to aesthetics and to our experiences of different kinds of media, whether it's television or radio or whatever. I want to draw a distinction between affective covariation and emotional elaboration. Permit me to explain. And these two approaches to aesthetics, these two dynamics, should be seen in relationship to depth of engagement. First, the principle of affect covariation. This is really about modulating 
our feeling states to satisfy our needs. How do we take these psychology words and turn them into everyday ideas? Well, look, if we're bored, we can intentionally seek out stimulation, such as action film. We don't really want to get into the depth of it. I just need some uncertainty, some arousal, some stimulation. If we're in need of intimacy or social connection, we might intentionally talk about some sort of romantic film that we want to watch. Something that shows people bonding. It doesn't have to be romantic. It could just be a friendship film. But the point is, you have a certain need. And you're selecting your media experience, whether it's a film, whether it's a play, with foreknowledge to plan for what your experience will be like. But this is more on the surface. We're modulating the dimensions of pleasure. We're modulating the experience of arousal or excitement. That's what our goal is. We pick the medium to match the needs. And in a certain sense, it terminates when our needs are satisfied. So I've had enough of the action. It's too much. You can turn it off and go to bed. Affect modulation. It bears adding that people also prefer a moderate level of stimulation. When we're looking at works of art or we're looking at films or reading literature, we want moderate stimulation. We don't want to be overstimulated. Too much is happening at once. We know when we're in traffic. You can have a certain kind of music on and suddenly everything's becoming uncertain. Can you turn, can you not? And you turn it down because you've just gotten too stimulated. It doesn't fit. But this is all about modulation. We have bodily states on the dimension of pleasure, on the dimension of arousal to which we are tuned. We are sensitive and we pick our aesthetic experiences and our daily experiences so that they fit. Affective covariation. Affect because we're dealing with pleasure or excitement and arousal. Covariation because we want to have a fit between what we're seeing out there and our needs so they work in synchrony and modulate and satisfy our states. On the other hand, we have this principle of emotional elaboration which goes more deeply into the aesthetic experience. It integrates the thinking I, E-Y-E, -E, and being I, capital I. The interpretation of situational and aesthetic experience is deeper than just mere appraisal as good or bad because it has existential value. What I'm looking at or what I'm reading or what I'm experiencing is relevant to me. There's a bridge between me and the work. These links between the self and the work awaken episodic memories, conscious or unconscious, something in that work is reaching into my life. Deeper aesthetic engagement occurs when the recipient permits this work to resonate. We need to have an aesthetic attitude that permits the experience to unfold. Winnicott has talked about transitional objects and the true self. Consider an aesthetic work to which we're attached, sort of like our teddy bears in our childhood. That work is especially meaningful to me. If everything is burning in my apartment, I will save that work because it is my life. It talks to me, it speaks to me, it resonates with me. And when we say that, what we're really saying is it resonates with my personal history and my emotional history. We search for coherence in that work. We spend time building a bridge to that work. We search exhaustively through the work. We look at it again and again and find different nuances in the film or the story of the artwork that speaks to us. Something is going on there and we feel it before we know it. We feel it before we understand it. It's automatic. It is deeper. It is resonating with our unconscious. In short, the deeper the analysis, the deeper the resonance, the greater the elaboration, and ultimately, our attachment to the work and our memory for the work or our memory for the film. Sometimes you think about a film that you saw many years ago and you just know you loved it. You don't remember the details of the film, but something about that film spoke to you. And if the film is just presented to you again, of course you rediscover why. Depth of elaboration. And depth of elaboration is not just cognitive analysis, but it's personal 
emotional meaning. You are moved by the work. You are empathic with the work. And we have to add that a relationship to a work like this, when we speak with our friends about it, or reflect about it over time, provides an opportunity for a sign of transcendence, moral heightening, greater awareness, because we are outside the experience. And we look back and say, I was so moved by that movie. I was so moved by that book, that painting, that play, that television program. Why? And now that you're outside of it, you can look back and begin to realize, oh, it reminded me of my childhood, just like a dream. It brought back personal meanings. In other words, Affective co-variation solves needs for pleasure and excitement. It's transitory. It's more superficial. When the need is resolved, you can turn it off. But it doesn't build deeper bridges. Emotional elaboration builds a link where it's not an affective fallacy. It's an affective plus because that work resonates with life meanings for you. Now I want to turn to a somewhat different theme that's related national cultural differences that have an impact on our emotional relations to art and theater and how the theater and the art affects us, both directions. First, I want to talk about enlightened mimesis and I want to go to 18th century England. The English tradition of disinterested enjoyment implies that we stand back and we enjoy the work for itself. It implies a separation. It implies a search for unity amidst the diversity, but it's a little bit of an intellectual search. Simulation is important here because it is like a landscape. It's like something that's familiar. It has an effect on us. It affects us. It has a certain reality to it. The 18th century Enlightenment approached theater in the same way. It emphasized manipulating the audience's imagination and reaction based on mimesis, the controlled imitation of nature, so that the event could shape the person with whom it had some resonance. It was familiar. So if I control what I'm showing you and how I'm showing it to you, I will control how you feel, where control is the operative term. Simulation and likeness are sufficient to evoke feelings of emotion. It's very external. It's very rational. I can do a play. I can do a work in such a way that I will affect you. The French neoclassical tradition in the same way, spoke about the three unities of time and place and action in shaping dramatic illusion, where illusion is the operative term. It makes the piece seem real to you. It takes you in. Diderot, the French encyclopedist, described a very interesting paradox between an actor who exhibits passion on the stage while maintaining total self-control. The greater the self-control of the actor, the more the audience is overcome by the performance. So the actor is not really personally engaged. The actor is simulating, but with such skill that the person watching is totally overwhelmed. The actor can be telling jokes off to the side, but it looks real to you. In contrast, I want to talk about romantic resonances. And this is in the context of 18th century German romantics, like Anton Schlegel, for whom situations and historical traditions should be meaningful to the audience. We're not just simulating. We're dealing with real issues that are relevant to real people sitting before us in the theater. His nephew, August Schlegel, described aesthetic illusion as, quote, a waking dream to which we voluntarily surrender ourselves. We have an agreement with the stage. We come to the stage. August Schlegel was the German who translated Shakespeare from English to German. His goal was to present the fundamental conflicts of daily life so they could be experienced in a multi-layered way. So he's looking for resonance, 
not mimesis and simulation, by bringing imagination to the experience of relevant life situations, we're placed in a position to express our pent-up emotions, Aristotle's notion of catharsis, and achieve a deeper understanding of both life and ourselves. But you see that difference between the English and the German approaches. In the English approach, classical theater, we behave in a certain way to create an effect in the audience. So to speak, we manipulate the audience, however benignly. The German approach is different. The situation is what matters. And the situations have to be meaningful and resonate to us. And in that context, the bridge is built spontaneously and meanings are searched out. And I finally want to introduce in these three domains the Tao of Aesthetics, T-A-O. In the Taoist Chinese tradition, landscape painting provides an empty space for viewers to wander, to imagine and create meaning. The purpose of Chinese landscape painting is to embody a certain kind of atmosphere that expresses rhythm and conveys the experience of being in nature, the experience of being in nature, not just like a Western landscape that has cows and trees, but open empty spaces that you can project yourself into. We just aren't simply detached. It's not a landscape over there. It's a landscape that we enter into. By emphasizing the spiritual qualities of the landscape, the painting's goal is to help us achieve an inner harmony between mankind, humankind, and nature. The phrase is, the Tao abides in the emptiness. It invites us in. Like a soft edge painting that's sort of fuzzy and brings us in to interpret, I discussed this in my last lecture, the viewer is invited to, con to complete the image in a bottom-up manner and thereby becoming absorbed and experienced with the meaning of the space. The viewer is participating to complete the image and in a resonant way building a bridge. In this context, we can experience mental time travel and lose ourselves in paintings, thereby experiencing a sense of calm and transcending the boundaries of our egos. So in the English context, the goal is to simulate an environment that's so real it affects us. And in the German case, the goal is to pick situations of crisis and meaning that are unresolved as part of discovering the self that draw us in. And in the Chinese case, the goal is to provide an atmosphere that we can project ourselves into. Therefore, find a harmony with nature. Finally, I just want to address one issue. The culture wars between high and popular art have a strong impact on emotion as well. It's a politically loaded topic because the very notion of high art implies class conflict. People have to be wealthy enough to own it or to attend museums as opposed to the less cultured folk who haven't been exposed to these kinds of refined cultural moments. But really what's going on is in high art you have this application of conventional codes. These are good enough paintings to be in museums. These are paintings by famous people. They have a certain authenticity and embody a certain aura. And we see it in the vulgarity of a focus not so much on the artwork today, but how much is being paid for it, which converge in elements of the absurd. Popular art is quite different. It's sometimes called low art, but let's use the word popular and be polite. It involves a spontaneous experience of pleasure in response to mass entertainment. Spontaneity, experience, mass entertainment. It's event-oriented. And it can also involve a kind of critical look at the world today. And it's also meaningful for people who feel excluded from that high art world. Now let's move past high and popular art as separate class-based kinds of views. One might say that really high art represents a transformation of styles so we can appreciate what a person has done in relation to what went before and how they've changed it. And it falls in a kind of unfolding history of a particular medium. The expressive responses to popular art are very time-bound. And they involve a combination of feelings 
and meanings that are tied to the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or whatever era the music of your high school days resonates with. So high art is about transformation in style. Popular art can be critically reflective and ties us to the times of our culture. But what begins as popular art can go viral and become shared by people in the high art domain. And the digital world has broken the boundaries between high and popular. So the popular can gain meaning for a broader audience and become in essentially high culture in sum. When we talk about emotional responses to art and media, we cannot separate it from thoughts and ideas. But the emphasis that I bring is the following. The surface level of response to art simply identifies things, modulates feelings, fulfills needs. But the deeper level of analysis is one where we appreciate the meanings and intentions of the artist in a cultural context that resonate with our own private lives and those who share our culture. It is in that context that we have deeper attachment, deeper meanings, and remember the work long after we first encountered it. Thank you.